a simple farm community, untouched by time, a gruesome secret has been protected for generations. I'll tell you how it originated. I read an article in National Geographic about the Amish people. And I, was I didn't know that much about the Amish people. I was reading, I was looking at the visuals, the pictures, the way they live. They live like in the Middle Ages. They haven't really changed since the Middle Ages. They don't use machinery or electricity or anything like that. And it just struck me that that would be a great location for a horror movie. So that's what really pulled me into wanting to do that film. It was just, this is a strange subculture of Americans that most other Americans really don't know about. And wouldn't it be interesting because they do live a, a very suppressive kind of religion and that's the kind of thing that makes great horror because whenever there's a lot of repression or suppression, you keep pushing things down and as a result, it's much harder to get the truth out and that makes for horror. So I just thought visually it was provocative and uh, I thought that it's just an interesting world to explore. That one is good. This one is proper. You think? And there were very few movies that had ever done anything about the Amish people. Uh, later Witness came out, uh, but that was after Deadly Blessing. So there were really no films that had ever been done, as far as I know, about the Amish people. So I just thought it was a natural for a horror movie. Servant of the Incubus! I was a huge fan of horror movies. I was just a beginning screenwriter myself, but I was really uh, influenced by movies like um, Carrie. I like, um, I always really loved horror movies that were more story driven, like Carrie. And so it's not just to scare people, but there's interesting characters, a good plot twists, and it's not just about slashing up people. So that's one of the reasons that uh, I really was interested in Deadly Blessing because it was really about, you know, interesting characters, some good themes, a good plot, and at the same time, great situations for horror. I knew Wes Craven uh, about two years before we did Deadly Blessing, and that was because I had adapted a book by Lois Duncan called Summer of Fear, and the producer and I, Max Keller, who also was the producer of Deadly Blessing, we were looking for horror directors, and Wes Craven was an up-and-coming horror director. So we got him onto the project, and he directed uh, Summer of Fear, uh, and at that time I got to know him, and he was, you know, very professional, and uh, he did a great job doing that TV movie. And then, of course, when we were looking for a director to do Deadly Blessing, our first choice was Wes Craven, who was slowly becoming more and more well known in the horror genre. I think he did at that point. He had done Last House on the Left, um, and he had done. Hills Have Eyes, I believe, at that time, too. So to have him attached to Deadly Blessing was actually a great positive thing for us and helped us get the movie made. Who are these Hittites, anyway? Amish or what? No, no connection. According to Martha, the Hittites make the Amish look like swingers. Sharon Stone, that was her second film. She had done a small bit with Woody Allen. She knew very little about acting. She was a model, and she came onto the film set. She was really scared. She didn't know how to act or what to do. And I remember, um, this is a funny story, it's my, my, my strongest memory about Deadly Blessing, is that she kept on asking Wes for guidance and direction, and he doesn't do a lot of that. He likes to set up shots. He's a master of setting up shots, but he doesn't really get into a lot of the giving the actors a lot of guidance. So in the middle of the shoot, she stood up and she screamed, God damn it, would you direct me? And I remember the whole crew 
was totally shocked by this because normally that doesn't happen on a film set. And everyone was just really quiet and Wes went over and said a few words to her and laughed and, and that was it. So that was Sharon Stone. That was her second film. And of course she ended up becoming this huge movie star. The other girls were also not all that experienced. And then there was Ernest Borgnine, who was, you know, extremely experienced. He'd done a million movies. And Lois Nettleton, who also was a very experienced actress, had done a lot of stage, a lot of film. So it was a mix of people that had done very little film and very veteran actors. You'll be working now, yeah? I'm Vicki Anderson. I'm a friend of Martha's. We are the kindred of God. We have no business with the serpents. Because Wes is an, a technician, he's the great, one of the greatest you know, horror technicians there's ever been. But in terms of working closely with actors and helping them through their acting problems, that's not what he's into. So he usually casts to get a certain quality, and he just expects that the actor is going to deliver it. He's just incredibly good with the technical aspects of scaring people. They usually do that when one of their own dies. We shot in Waxahachie, which is outside of Dallas. The land is rather bleak. There's these large uh, fields that are dark, and it was overcast most of the time. It's sort of a cold beauty. The farms are quite isolated. We were shooting in a farm that was owned by, <laughs> it's funny, the guy who owned the farm was named Pig. So it was the Pig Farm, <laughs> that was his last name. And it was just this farm out in the, out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, so we had a lot of privacy, uh, fantastic crews. At that time, there was a lot of shooting going on in Texas. It was a way to save money because you could get a lot more production value for your money. And the crews are top notch there in Dallas. So we had fantastic crews, really good hair and makeup, really good gaffers and all kinds of technical people. And uh, they were very enthusiastic and it was really easy to shoot there. Hey, would you like this on toast? No. Oh! There is a staple in horror movies, which is women in jeopardy because it's a lot scarier to see women being terrorized than it is for men being terrorized. So a lot of the great horror movies do have women in jeopardy. But I think this film is different because we have very strong women. The women are the ones who are figuring things out and trying to find the killer and uh, you know, doing what is normally the male protagonist role. So. I think that made it interesting. What's an incubus? Some sort of a devil that seduces the faithful in his sleep. Or it just comes after you and takes you like a beast. Oh, God. <laughs> that was never in the script, that there's some real monster. The whole point of the film to me is that there are no demons or monsters or incubuses. It's just the, the evil in people's hearts or the suppression that people go to to keep their feelings down. So the Amish are keeping all their natural feelings down because they live in such a rigid world. And um, Lois Nettleton, who plays the mother, she hates men, so she's keeping her feelings down. She won't even let her daughter, which won't even let her son be a boy. She, he must be a girl, so she's repressing all kinds of things. So that is the real evil, is people's feelings that are not allowed to, to express themselves. And then at the end, we, that, that whole idea completely gets thrown on its head that this monster comes out. And I think, and I was shocked to tell you the truth, I had no idea that was going to happen. I had, when I was watching the, when I went to the premiere, I couldn't believe that that was the ending. I knew why they did it though. I know why the studio wanted that because it was the Carrie ending. 
it's at the end of Carrie, they go to the graveside of Carrie, and all of a sudden this hand comes out and grabs it, and, and it's this huge shock, and people are screaming, and that became a very typical horror ending. So they were going for that same ending with this monster coming out and grabbing Marin Jensen. But I just thought that that completely negated what the film was really about. So I wasn't a big fan of that ending, even though it is visual, it is shocking, and some people are scared by it. But to me, it, it hurt the film. Well, it was released in 3,000 theaters. I remember that. Universal ended up releasing it. It was a rather big release at the time. 3,000 theaters at that time was a pretty big release. And, uh, you know, it did moderately well. And for some reason, though, it, it didn't have the cult status at that time that's like Last House on the Left had or Hills Have Eyes, those two. And I think because they were so, they were the independent kind of freaky films and they gained this cult status where maybe it was the fact that Deadly Blessing was more of a major release by Universal. So it didn't worm itself into the hearts of the big horror fans that love that kind of independent horror film. But um, I think it did okay box office in the beginning, and then, uh, but it never really seemed to uh, take off in the way that a lot of other Wes's horror films did. So this is great that, that this release is happening because people get a chance to see, you know, one of his, uh, one of his better films. Mm -hmm.